to start from 30. <laughs> uh, okay, today we are going to talk about chapter 5 of the uh, semantic uh, book, uh, which is about semantic for services. Uh, this presentation uh, is with me, which I'm a PhD student here working on semantic technology. And um, I'm Michael, and I'm an undergraduate. Working on semantic. Working on. Uh, so, uh, web service, uh, W3C has a really good definition for web service and it says, web service is a software system designed to support machine to machine interaction over the network. So, we have uh, so many applications or services in the network and web service is designed to um, interact between these services. So, uh, of course web service has a framework because that's a protocol and um, there are so many questions we need to answer when we think about web services. First of all, what goes on the wire? When uh, two services are supposed to interact with each other, uh, we need to know the formats and the protocol. And we need to actually uh, uh, describe what goes on the wire with the description language as well. Uh, so we need protocol, we need description language, and also we need to actually find a way what allows us to find this description. Somehow we need to find this description, we need to find these um, services, which is called discovery of services. So uh, today we try to actually, first of all, go a little bit about the background of different protocol of web services, different terminology probably you need to know, and uh, then we talk about the challenges in web services, as the web service discovery, and come with the idea of rule of semantic in web services, how semantic can help to solve these challenges or uh, over these challenges. And uh, we will talk about the semantic annotation of web services and finally uh, we start talking about some use cases, the real use cases and uh, also we're going to have a demo of the uh, some applications which already uh, developed here at Noise Center. Uh, also, these are the resources. Perhaps you look at the resources at the end of the chapter. I didn't put them again here, but these are the extra resources. You can use that for future work. And also during the, this presentation, I will go to, through some of these resources. First of all, I will go through the Kino project, which is implemented here. So the wiki page for Kino project is here. You can access that. Uh, wiki project has a few uh, actual publications, but the original publications is this one from 2011, uh, you can probably probably read that already. And also, uh, there is a handbook of a uh, service description, which I also was the co-author of that. Uh, I put the link here, you can access it. And uh, another web service, which during the uh, presentation, me and my friend, we tried to go through that. For some examples, is the European Bioinformatics Institute, EBR which they have really good services for bioinformatics area. So we will go through that and I will show you some of the examples. Another one is biocatalog. It's good if you look at that. I sent all of these actual links ben, also in Google Group. Is this on? Uh, yes. Uh, I sent all of these links already in Google Group uh, last night. Hopefully you had a chance to look at that. So we will go through biocatalog sometimes to show the services and the example of services and also uh, there is a really simple uh, tool called SOAP UI, which you can uh, invoke web services and see exactly how it's going on when we talk about the um, parameter passing or when we talk about like um, operations, what exactly we mean. So we try to go through these resources during the presentation. Um, so. <coughs> okay, like Nishisa said earlier, there's uh, two types of web services. Um, SOAP and REST. Uh, SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. Um, it's still used, I guess, quite a bit today, but um, REST is the most predominant one being used at the moment. Mostly because REST, oh, good call. Um, mostly because REST uses uh, HTTP, um, HTTP uh, verbs are like the um, arguments that you can pass into an HTTP request to uh, do different things on the server, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, here's a <coughs> real simple diagram of a web or a SOAP um, request. Uh, your software one um, sends a request over to uh, software two, and it calls one of its functions. 
And then, um, I mean, and this is just like the internet or some way to transfer HTTP. Um, <coughs> and software two will uh, execute one of the functions and output uh, WSDO, which stands for a Web Service Description Language. Um, and it can go straight to back to server one, but um, there could be like a mediary in here. In this case, it's a universal description discovery and integration library, um, which would send the <coughs> WSDO back to uh, the software one. Um, okay. Uh, web service description language is um, the it's the um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Uh, in this uh, actual oh, right. document. Yeah, and if you go to that link also, there is more information. Uh, yeah, you can show exactly the, new, the example yeah. of... Like right here is the yes. name of like the functions you can call. You can or see the, the name of the fields. Yeah. Do you want to show them the, the SOAP UI that you can or import that? No, we can do it later okay, in okay. the demo time. In demo time, I'll show you exactly how we can use this uh, VSDL file. Okay, um, the other type of web framework is uh, represent, representational state transfer. Um, this is uh, a client-server um, interaction. Uh, the thing that um, defines uh, REST are these four things here. Um, the, when it says stateless, that means that all of the state of uh, the users using the application is all stored and taken care of on the client side, so the um, server has like no idea or um, reference to the state of any of the, its users at the moment. You can click on the, one of this, because we don't really want to go fast, we really want to make sense exactly what we're talking oh. about, so we can go to Yeah, if you want to learn more about REST, there's a, this right here. So it's about all of the features, main features in the REST. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you can just go through and read that. Uh, but A or D event, the, uh, the features, the, is how the, you know, the, the feature, how you know, like stateless or how cache or uniform interface they have. Guys, nice. uh, look at the screen there and talk to this audience and talk to um, <clears throat> here is a another simple representation of uh, um, of a restful API uh, back and forth between a client and a web server um, the client would send a request to the web server and the thing that makes different the big difference between soap and rest is that rest a lot of uh, the computation is done on the client side but in REST, all of the computation will be done on the server. All you do is ask for a, um, a resource, and the server will send you back all of it in uh, some kind of like output document, usually HTML or XML, but it could be JSON or any other <coughs> format language like that. Um, yeah, any uh, web service that follows uh, the RESTful protocol is considered a RESTful web API. Um, I think there is a list of them here. Oh, that's cool. This one example of RESTful web services. Um, as I said, in Biocatal, you can go and search for any specific uh, um, service you want. For example, you're concerned about, as a user, you want to see, is there any service you can do? use an internet for like, uh, I just use one, one body called a sequence and just like something bodies want to do or struct protein structure. You just name the search you have like as a keyword and we'll show up uh, that all of the services exist, both for SOAP and uh, REST. Let's see together, for example. I just search, I have protein.
can see uh, in different tabs, it says you just the services. Perhaps you can go with a really more narrow uh, query, but there are like this much of services exist, and uh, like uh, 20 of them are SOAP operations, and 19 of 70 are REST and uh, endpoint operations. So, um, I just, so, um, yes, sure. Oh. I was just wondering if this, this particular website, is it using RESTful? So it's kind of biocatalog, if the name is port. Can I see? Yeah, oh, it's self, uh, it's biocatalog itself. Uh, we use soap or this kind of, uh, we cannot exactly say, but this is for mostly service discovery. Mm -hmm. So to try to discover services. So, yeah. So it, it is like a repository where you can register your services into, the, into that website. And if anybody wants to use your service, they will just go It's like a library. Yeah. So that's what's the UDDI part? That's also another library. Oh, that's yeah. different then? Yeah. That's yeah. Okay, okay. But this is more actually user friendly. Just uh, you can go and just search for a specific term you want, you want or a specific operation or service you want, and they just return a bunch of services for you. Then you can go for each of them. Uh, one question? Sure. So you talk about two type of web services, SAP and REST. So what is the difference between the two and when to use when you need to use SAP and when you need to use REST? That's so like a slide. Yeah. Up next there is a slide he will go to explain. Okay. Right, yeah. Because uh, he actually very well compare one by one exactly the differences. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, four defined aspects of a RESTful uh, API service. Um, the Every resource has its own URI, and you use um, the HTTP verbs, get, put, delete, and uh, post to uh, interact with them. Um, the actual URL that you'll see, it, depending on what you're actually um, referencing, the verbs will do slightly different things. Um, and the internet media type is kind of like the MIME type. So like if it's a image or a JSON document or an HTML document, it'll have it in its header. So uh, that makes programming things a little bit easier. Um, I think there's a good example here on what... Okay, yeah. So this is making requests to a, a backslash resources, and this is making a backslash resources with this particular item. Um, if you do a git on uh, just the resources, you're going to get the, um, a whole collection of resources. And the same with um, put, you'll replace the entire resource. Um, post, you will uh, actually uh, just append to the resources uh, as a collection. And delete, you'll delete the entire um, uh, collection as a whole. But when you're actually accessing like, a particular item, um, get will not only retrieve the uh, details of that particular item, but it will also return the MIME type and any other things that are specified uh, in the API. Um, put will replace or create a new um, item if it doesn't already exist. Um, post isn't really used a whole lot when it comes to like a particular item, uh, usually because put does most of the work for you. Um, and delete just deletes in a particular item, um, as you would probably guess. Um, so since we have all of these web services, uh, they're, it's kind of challenging to, um, with all of this information, to be able to search all these APIs and to, uh, like if there's different, like slightly difference between them, like which one is better for you, um, and being able to use one as like an input for the other, like using them as a, uh, a whole system, it gets kind of complicated when you have all these different APIs, um, and they all have like different formats. Um, it looks like that slide I was talking about is not in here, but um, the reason uh, REST is more useful than SOAP is because in a SOAP request, you have to make a whole SOAP header, and you have to have like a SOAP envelope, a SOAP header, and a SOAP body, and you have to create this whole thing yourself and then send it to the server and then it has to do stuff with it, and there's a lot of overhead there. But if you have um, just your 
uh, if you just have like one client sending HTTP requests, it's a lot less overhead. Um, it's uh, a lot easier to learn. It's faster. It, there's just a lot of good, positive things about REST. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, was that at the end? Yeah. Um, what I just said, I guess. The main thing too is that SOAP you have to do a lot of the computation like on the client side, where as in REST. If you just ask for a resource, and then the um, server will send you back that resource. Um, is this? Okay. Um, oh right. Um, data mediation. Data mediation. Uh, like sending data from one web service to another um, and reducing manual effort. So if you're able to annotate two uh, web services outputs and they might have different formats, you can still um, know that they have like two things are uh, from the same um, like class and you can connect them easier even though they're not the same file format. Um, what semantics does to help uh, these problems with um, all of our with that many uh, APIs is um, if you annotate all of the uh, functions in in an API, you can uh, with some kind of consistent vocabulary, you can um, actually annotate different functions that are similar in each of them, and that way you're able to like search the API for different functionality, whether or not you know what the name of the function is or if it actually exists. Um, for composing services, that was the same, what I was just saying, how you can connect two services together uh, without, um, it, it would take a lot more manpower and time to sit down and figure out the two outputs of each and try to get them to work together and semantics can help with that. <coughs> already explained uh, why you really, uh, somehow why we uh, need the semantic and somehow we want to over these challenges uh, we already discussed. So here, uh, this is a picture from the book and uh, probably all of you looked at that before. Uh, we, I want to go through this and show you exactly how semantic can help here. So imagine uh, you have like, uh, there is a consumer which offers services, right? Uh, and um, you want to actually ask for a service from that, as like a, a service provider, and you are a client, and you want to ask service. How does that really work? He tried to actually, when you ask for a specific services, uh, try to uh, assess that. So it can be with the software application, with the hardware, and also the human resource, which they, they have. So uh, I don't talk about hardware here, just think about the soft, just software application itself uh, and databases and all of those things, API um, and human resource. For software application, um, um, actually can, that um, consumer can go through and use web services through like a um, different kind of protocol it has already installed or installed. Uh, file or or also can go through the lightweight uh, web services like uh, REST web services and um, search through that and uh, try to decide which service to use. Uh, also here, uh, human are involved. Any kind of uh, like say the manager of the project, the developer, uh, somebody that maintains the project, and uh, etc. So uh, you can see kind of different resources here and how the sem semantic can really help here. Semantic can add meaning to these resources. And because potentially um, when actually you want to underst understand the actually semantic of each operation, there are so many, uh, so many ways. Um, do you know which way? Do you have any idea? Right. Um, if you want to understand the semantic of each operation, there are three ways to understand the semantic of operation. Pre-agreement, 
Yes, <coughs> or it is in the board. So uh, there, there is pre-agreement uh, documentation and service element annotation. <coughs> okay, what is pre-agreement? That is to make an agreement as to what exactly is going to be used so that they they know both the client and who is providing both should know what exactly is going to be used. They yeah. should be familiar and the client should be able to use. God, will you contract between the client and uh, uh, for Sorry, the old terms and operations, yeah. they want to use, right? But sometimes in client, they use different terms, uh, like, um, contract. yeah, for a contract or yeah, agreement contract. Uh, for the common terms. That's true. Uh, thanks. And the documentation, of course, is about, <coughs> yeah, uh, sometimes uh, the, actually um, uh, you need to have a documentation about exactly what's the operation of these services, how is that work, how you can access it, what's the parameters, all of this kind of thing. And in this case, a client has to go through all of the documentation and read about it. Uh, or, I mean, when I say client, I don't mean that just human, even agent, right? He has to go and access and somehow automatically or semi-automatically access to that and get the data. So with service element annotation or service element annotated, we try to annotate all of these um, uh, web services as, for, as well as the document. All of these resources with the term from doing um, models with like this can be from taxonomy ontology or any kind of dictionary so that's the way actually semantic can help which we already talked about that before starting so I just wanted to go through this example to make it clear so. okay um, when you annotate a web service these are the four main components Michael. Uh, there's Michael oh, um, <coughs> there is a uh, Functional semantics, which is annotating the different functionality that your web service has. Um, there's data semantics, which is a formal description of how uh, the web service like in, uh, exchanges its data. Um, the non-functional uh, semantics is for like lower level protocols and things of that nature that really aren't tied to what the web service is actually uh, doing. Um, and then the one that I found really neat was uh, the um, execution semantics, where you can annotate your um, runtime behavior, exceptions that can be thrown. Um, and uh, but by doing that, if you're a client using a web service, you can interact with it more. Instead of like if an error happens, you're not just going to get like a 500. You're going to get like some kind of meaningful like error message, and you're going to have a lot better um, ability to uh, implement like a um, semantic uh, web service if it has done these things really well. Um, all right. But before actually moving to SRS, which is the second part of our presentation, uh, I'm just concerned about that. You can see this uh, four type of semantic is started from uh, Dr. Shetra's in 2003 and still in 2011 we have the same thing. Do we have any idea if there is, maybe there is other kind of semantic that we exist? So they were like, like eight years, almost the same. Well that policy was again, I will quote there, yes. so it's the same thing that yeah. continued. But I don't know, are there any other type of semantics that we can think of for services? You need to be able to describe what service what a service does, web service does, and you want to capture different aspects of it. You you break it down into different aspects of service. That service needs the data, takes the data as an input. Service gives data as an output. So semantics of that data can be described by annotating those data. Service does something. Uh, what kind of suppose service says I can give you a quote of something. 
Then you can ask the question, well, what do you mean by the quote? Quote of the day, quote for the stock, quote for uh, getting your product bill, right? So as the semantics, what does it mean? Suppose I have a, um, uh, a function uh, or, or called quote, right? Then, then what does the, what is the meaning of that? Right, interpretation of that. Again, that you capture is functional thing. Or oh, it will take, uh, or the average time it takes to execute the service is five seconds. Well, how do you describe that? Well, that is the quality of service, which is a non-functional, and that these are the possible error codes, and this is the conditions in which that uh, the and there is a standardized description of all the errors. Then you may talk about the. Um, exception or uh, you know execution semantics what you are talking about is uh, then should be model uh, think about it I think it should be possible to model what you're talking about it in one of using one or more of these basic type of semantics there's nothing more to service than what cannot be captured here right if people need to if you change the parameter that means you are changing the description of uh, input output so interface definition would have to be changed Interpretation def definition would primarily change the functional definitions, functional descriptions, and so that is what you have described. But at, the, at, a, at the level of the type of thing you have to model, that's already covered. I don't think it's a new type of things you have to model. Yes, it is an interesting example where there is a change that could ha happen, and that change needs to be passed on. Well, how do you pass on? How, do, how would the other party understand what the change parameters mean? Uh, today, uh, earlier, um, it uh, service required that you give the unit, uh, you know, in only uh, uh, kgs, uh, and uh, now it can take either kg or pounds. So far as you describe in uh, this particular format, you need to pass that around. Well, then you are going to describe that in the data, uh, you know, because that you describe the data for input, and uh, uh, you're going to make it as a part of data semantics. Yeah, I wonder like, uh, so if you take this type of semantic, right, why do you want to categorize them on the web search, right? If you just take the, the concept of programming, right, and mm -hmm. if you just do a, a, a enterprise program, there you find the same semantics. Web, web search is just a one one kind of example of that. Uh, it's meant to be in this uh, particular title has the uh, web search, right? Still, the so programming does not change. Even though the paradigm change, the things, the core fundamental thing doesn't change. So I don't think that these four semantics, uh, apart from these four semantics, right? I don't think another can come up. Uh, so because yeah, that's a valid point. It's that that's perfectly valid. Uh, the point is, um, it's, you know, you kind of define things that are typically an object, like a data document, and that is. You talk about semantics for them, and you talk about anything that is active, that is a behavior, runtime behavior, any programming. Web service is just one form of programming per se. They are programs, basically, right? And for any programs you, will, uh, you know that you put it on internet, particularly on the web, they would have this kind of behavior. So it will apply to any programming stuff you want. That's quite true. Uh, but that is the same as saying web service is a type of programming, and uh, uh, it so happens that. The uh, there are not two. There, there's nothing more about programming that cannot be described here. That of this sub subtype, which is web service. Yeah, exactly. Even though in like W3C definition of web services, it's a, a software system. So it's not something really different. Um, so I, I have one question. So I remember that HP SOA project. They have uh, HP what? HP SOA project is a very big project. It lasts for like five six years. So in that they um, they manage the life cycle of web services. So in that case, so let's say if uh, once web services move from one state to like different state activities different, right? Mm -hmm. So in that if you um, if you want to model the semantic of the life cycle, so where do you want to put them into? Semantics of what? Of the life cycle management. Life so cycle. Management. you are talking about the workflow so of web with, services, right? Of semantic that we should put it into. So, okay. First of all, I, I, I yeah. First of all, try to understand your question. Everybody just be on the same page. 
uh, you are talking about make a workflow of web services, right? And you, uh, your que your question is if one se one web service want to interact with another web service, how which kind of data? No, no he, she's talking about this life cycle, yeah. and so you know, for example, versioning issue is an oh, example of it, right? The so so right so so uh, compared to the semantics we capture for a single web service, the life cycle service has lot more metadata, a lot of changes. You have to change, you know, from this was this, then this came out this version, and there's a delta between them. Um, we, you know, this was not presented to capture the life cycle of service per se, but if you really wanted to, those of the, the, the life cycle related specifications will become typically part of non-functional specification. These are a form of non specification that will typically not be found in a single web service. So the life cycle management aspects would have additional parameters that would typically not be found on a single web service, but they are still going to be class of non-functional uh, you know, service, saying that, oh, this is a this is web service, but this has different stages of the web service, this is a different version of the web service, each of the web service has different, you know, uh, who, are, who created it, who changed it, uh, but if uh, if we um, in uh, let's say in two state of the web service, and if we change any function functions of the web service, like we add additional parameter or we change uh, whatever the message, mm -hmm. and then that would affect to the uh, function of mm -hmm. yeah. So you could, between uh, versions of them, uh, the, the you know all aspects can change. But the point is, it's a you know this what is applicable for snapshot. For the life cycle, you have to manage the transitions of from one service, you know, version to another to another as they evolve. There was no discussion in any of the things uh, that really captures all the implication of life cycle. You can model from the, it still belongs to the same broad classes because these are some, you know, very broad classes, but nobody explicitly discussed the life cycle related parameters. So, I have another example of that, maybe it's mature. Uh, for, for example, for description for a water file, they have like different operations. Uh, I just, uh, for one of the water files, I try to invoke with SOAP UI. They have like uh, not only the operation like get or result, they have also set a status or uh, get a status. So, for with invoking that operation, also we can get the status of the um, of the service. If we can annotate this status, then there will be a solution. The operation will get a status. So uh, now we actually move on to SRS. SRS is actually the semantic annotation of the resources, which is the W3C uh, member submission uh, in April 2010. And uh, as you can see, the authors are um, Professor Shed and also uh, Dr. Aji, which uh, is graduated. So we continue work on that. And um, so if you want to have more information about uh, the SRS and read more about uh, like all of the documentation and protocol and stuff like that. Just go to this web page. And um, uh, as a definition, uh, he actually defined here: SRS is a plain old semantic H HTML format to add additional metadata uh, to uh, REST API description HTML files. So uh, why actually we want to use SRS? I mean, uh, now we are at the middle of the class, you already know that, why? Because we are, want to use actually metadata from different models, we want to actually improve the search, because when we annotate, the search will be easier, and we want to actually also facilitate the data mediation between different services, and of course, provide easier integration of the services. Are there any, um, how do you account for security when you're using Well, in uh, REST, at least, you uh, if you want to handle authentication since there's no like state on the server. It doesn't it doesn't uh, know who's actually asking. Um, 
usually what happens is you'll send an initial post request with like a username and password, and you'll get like a token, and then you just send that token in your header every time, and it'll um, read that token and say that you're verified. Um, there's other ways I've seen people do it, um, like passing the username and password every single time, which is a bit ridiculous, but uh, yeah, that's how they do it. Is that the only security for that? So um, that could be bad to a, like a snatch and grab, or how long is that token a lot? Well, so you do a drive-by download, or? I think it's per request. Is it per you request? Make a request, and it sends a new token back so to you, and you use for your next request. Okay, all right. And um, SNR so far actually has been listed as a candidate for service annotation. Uh, you can see I put the reference here, and also um, that's good. The early version of that years ago, like 2007, also <coughs> has been used to uh, demonstrate partially how many recipe services. <coughs> so here, actually, um, I want to actually demo uh, the Kino tools which we have here. The Kino has started a long time ago as like an API hot project, and uh, AG work on that, and we continue working on that. That was, uh, from the beginning, it was about uh, the annotated document, uh, and we extended that to annotate the XML files as well, For and then uh, we tried to convert the services with the annotated XML file. So uh, here I just explain a little bit about Kino. Maybe some of you already know about the Kino. I'm sorry about that if you know, but for the rest, I just want to go through the architecture of the system and how it's actually um, work. Maybe if some of you are interested to continue working on that. I'm, and I work on that. You can just join the project if you want. And then I will demo and show you exactly how is that work and how we can download it. So, um, Kino, as I said, is an like, integrated suite of tools that enable scientists to annotate. It's not just for annotation. You can annotate, index, and search web-based documents. And uh, that's uh, actually the first version of Kino. And now uh, we can also do all of these things with XML files as well. The original publication of that is listed here. You can download that from the Noises library, of course. And uh, I'll put the link here. And also, there's a really good wiki page, uh, which um, there is um, uh, about exactly what is that, and a really good video there. You can just, I don't want to actually run the video now. It's like 12 minutes video. I will just demo it uh, live. <laughs> but uh, later, you can actually go and watch this video, which are really good. And uh, uh, also, um, Exactly ex ex about the, how the integration work, the architecture of the system, and then how uh, the user interface looks like. And also, you can easily, uh, there's a user guide for you to go and download that and work with that if you want as a plugin. So, and then if you have questions, just you can contact me. Um, just back to my presentation. Okay, here also in the showcase, you can find the keynote. Just click on that. So um, that was just to know where we can find the resources of Kino if you want. And uh, as I said, these integrated tools consist of NCDO integrated front end uh, for annotation part. The reason we actually use inter NCDO integrated front end as an API because we want to actually uh, during the annotation, we annotate with the ontology from NCDO. That's why uh, we use that uh, front end. And uh, also include the browser plugin to submission the annotation. If it's a little bit confusing, I will show you exactly a step by step. I'll just go through that, uh, and then I will show you each part how is that work. And then the annotation uh, back end to provide a uh, facet uh, search capabilities. I have, um, a, I have a question. Sure. More from maybe Dr. Shee. Hmm. How is security implemented into these? Like, how do you prevent from infinite redirect loops, from hack attacks from the outside, from malicious code? Like, if you're looking into an API and you're searching for websites, how do you determine that the website is actually legit and not like a fake site? And trying to execute maybe like a simple case of buffer overflow error, a known exploit, and then try and execute code on your server-based machine. So. Uh, Nothing we have discussed here really address service as, as, uh, 
security issues, uh, but there are um, already well-defined uh, security uh, standards with, with regards to web services. So, um, honestly, I have not looked at so security is not in my area and not nor a topic of uh, you know our discussions here. But security is tremendously important also. So, I saw, I saw like massive vulnerabilities come to mind when you guys were talking about these things, like possible ways you could execute and defeat the basically search engine, like turn into one. Well, any, but any web service would have the same problem. There's nothing new here about this versus any other web services based system. So, uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, if you can better find web services, doesn't do any, you know, doesn't change the, the security vulnerability anyway. Uh, it doesn't increase or decrease, right? This is just a search system that gets you to the right service, for example, service, uh, the right service, service that is the right meaning, does the right thing that you ask for. There are among many services there are. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't change the security challenges at all, but security challenges are for real, and but that's a separate issue. Okay, I was saying because it has to be more like um, it digs a little deeper to get the semantic meaning between the different. Right, but that that, is all, that 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 still helps you just searching for the right service or dis uh, getting the best description of service that you can, you know, to meet your needs. But it is uh, the vulnerability is uh, primarily all to do with the fact that you can invoke the service and uh, uh, you can pass on a parameter that could have unintended, you know, e effect or or you could. Uh, like denial of service, you just make too many calls, mm -hmm. many of the things of that nature. So all those are standard issues and uh, web service security is a pretty significant field in its own right. That, that I, you know, I mean, if you go to W3C and we are a member of W3C, you can have access to all the, uh, you know, uh, work on that area. There's plenty of work in this area. Okay. I'll point to you some, if you get to some. It's a big challenge. Uh, if you are interested to read more about that, if you go to the EBI website, the European uh, they have like the web services. There is a blog there. They discuss about this challenge and like what kind of problem. Uh, so uh, the Kino components is uh, okay. Uh, the annotation, indexing, and searching. Here is actually an overview of the architecture of the system. If for partially for part of them you don't understand, uh, there, this is also in the web page. You can go through that and read. But uh, for, uh, it starts with annotation part, which uh, with work with the plug we have a plugin, a Firefox plugin for that. Uh, the annotation part, as I said, uh, use the NCBO API to access the ontology um, uh, from NCBO, and then after you annotate the uh, the document, can be any web pages or like literature or. Uh, XML file, then you submit that annotation. When you submit the annotation, this will through the SRS uh, as a like XML document, and then uh, you have a, a repository of the annotation collection, uh, which go, which works with Solar Object, uh, which uh, we use the actually Solar uh, J library for that. And we have the indexing uh, annotation process because we need to index all of these annotation annotated files because we want to actually search through that and uh, retrieve those annotations. So we have there the index file repository and uh, another actually uh, part of the project is a search user interface, which I demoed that to you. And then you can go and search uh, any uh, annotation document or any concept which you annotated in the XML file or document and get the result. And the result could be any format, JSON, XML file, or any kind of format you just like. That's the whole uh, overview of the architecture of the system. So as I promised you, here is like a browser plugin. You need to just install it. Uh, and there is a guide in the wiki how to install that. Uh, and then uh, when you add it to you, just, um, OK, let's go and do the real demo instead of going to I'll just make a slide in the case we have internet problem or something. I have a slide step by step, but let's go to a real demo. Okay, say for example, I start with the annotation of the document and then I will go to annotation of XML file. I start with the easier one and then go to XML. So, for example, search go to wiki. Um, 
you have like a document here. This doesn't need to be wiki. We also uh, can work use this plugin for annotate any PDF file, any other files. I just use wiki here because we have. So let's you want to uh, you decide to annotate the gene here, right? So uh, you uh, when you click on that, you can see annotate as knowledge or concept. So it means when I select that, uh, can I really say what I want to do here? I, I try actually, try, here is a concept I have, I try to get this concept from other resources, right? And annotate this concept with other, with other ontologies, right? So why exactly do you want to do that? Why, why do you want to annotate? Because that's the whole meaning of annotation. Uh, no, you want I mean, to actually add the um, uh, other concept because you want to have the common vocabulary. You annotate this, you annotate another document, and all of those have like a common vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And you can search them, or you can uh, actually retrieve this mm -hmm. annotated. Here. So uh, here, as you can see, it uh, shows the available ontologies. Is uh, all of the ontology exists in SDO, and you can select uh, any of them. Because it here it means this is specific concept you select to annotate is shown in all of these ontologies, and that's now your decision to annotate which one of them, which one you like. Maybe somebody work with like uh, this ontology. Somebody else wants to work like protein protein interaction. Any of them. So I just select one. And then again, you can see all of the concepts exist in that ontology as gene name, gene neighbor, gene ontology, just show. I just annotate with this one and uh, with this idea, of course. And this is the URL for that. And um, just okay. You can see it's turned to be uh, right now. And the whole process happened here. Uh, I will show you the background, what's happened, which kind of information added to my file, to my HTML file, when I annotated that. So the next step will be just um, uh, publish annotation, right? You need to publish this annotation because as I show you in the architecture, you need to uh, annotate and publish to have it in the, your, your actual indexing file. You have to uh, save all of this uh, annotated file somewhere. Will this automatically be available to other people who are looking for the same type of annotations? We have it in our repository now. So yeah, if we uh, if we annotate, we have we save that. So if somebody else want to uh, actually see if this concept annotated, we can search. I'll show you the search. I finished. Should I submit this annotation to? Now is like actually the local host here, the Kino Index Manager. We just submit that to Index Manager. And if you go to the Kino, now I have to actually, I want to show this just annotation happened, right? We annotate with the concept from ontology. Now I want to search to see how we can use this annotated document to just retrieve this document. search engine, which uh, uh, search for annotated documents. So here I can just search for query like say gene, right? And then say find the content. We can find the annotated document. I annotated some other document also here. Then you can access to that document and retrieve that. Yeah. So this is just simple uh, like example. 
but perhaps you can annotate more like for uh, this actually uh, annotation tool is already used in other community we annotated a bunch of papers in the community phylogenetic people because they used to do manually and they were really happy when they had these tools to annotate automatically for them because where they want to annotate they have to look at which ontology they want now they have the list of ontology in front of them so easily they can just select and annotate and search so another part actually, uh, which may be more interesting uh, is ongoing project uh, is annotate the XML file, not just the document. Yeah. So uh, I opened one example here. Let's see, XML file. Next time is a specific XML file for uh, collection area. So let's open one of these examples. on the uh, ontologies that are available, or um, what I mean is that are some ontologies thought of more um, reputable than others? I'm just wondering how does a person determine oh, actually, I pick this ontology over this? You, you are probably familiar with OBO ontology as like umbrella for like biomedical ontology if someone is interested in biomedical area. Ontology under OBO is just the community accepted that and try to follow that uh, the way actually over foundry support that. But basically everybody in his field probably knows or through the community knows which which authority is better for it. Right? Mm -hmm. So that only way that we can uh, rank the concepts given I mean in the keynote. What exactly you want to do like rank the so concept I have a gene. Mm -hmm. so I just move it down the gene, mm -hmm. and I want to rank the list of the ontologies by the relevance. See, gene can be described in different contexts. Maybe. Yeah. It's something like that. I think that's what you're also asking. That's a good that could be a part of yeah. it as well. Yeah, because that's possible, for example, a gene just appear in one ontology, what is not exactly a bar gene, it's not like Go is not gene ontology, but just by accident. Yes. But now, actually, the keynote just show you all of the yeah. ontologies, uh, basically alphabets. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that case, that's a good project. So we can work on that. Add more, uh, like more intelligent search. But like add not just gene, also some other metadata. In general, in the web services, do they really? kind of so ranking the, for example, when we want websites to use, and we call for it, and we identify some of the for, for service composition and discovery, yeah, of course, they use ranking, because uh, there is whole like, a bunch of papers about service discovery, ranking. There is a paper um, uh, I can send you uh, about exactly how we rank web services, mm -hmm. basically. But here, actually, uh, we want to get the ontology, yeah, so we didn't rank it. But yeah, that's a project going on. Services. Uh, OK, there are example. How much time do we have? Yeah, I'll just go fast to this. Uh, see, for example, I want to annotate this one. It's an XML file. I want to t1, t2, t3 are like um, the tree, for example, right? And you want to annotate and add metadata. You want to add the tree box from ontology to this. For example, you want to say this tree is implemented by this specific method. That's useful, right? Because if somebody else wants to search for this to the expert, it has this metadata with that. So here I just say uh, switch to next XML annotation view. So here show you the annotation elements and the annotation elements which already annotated. We have not annotated anything yet. Then select so one of these.
purpose. Um, here you can see in the annotations that uh, you can add the metadata in the XML file. Uh, basically, say uh, what's the sources you want to add, what's um, refer to the file you want to add. But you need to go on. actually a specific node here, you want to, T3 is one of those three, right? You want to say um, this is the exact match or like the close match uh, to your um, concept from ontology, and you want to say, for example, uh, these are all of the uh, predicates from ontology. It's inferred by the use to build. This is just extracted from ontology or has input as a branch of, for example, I want to say uh, this tree is a method of like a maximum parsimony or something like that. I just search that and then actually this kind of annotation is semi-manual so somebody has to uh, have this knowledge exactly what he wants to annotate mm -hmm. and he has to know about the three pillars. Mm He's -hmm. searching to find the maximum or say parsimony in the ontology to see which ontology you can do. Okay, I found this, I just select this and then okay. You see that here just added the annotated I added two of them with the three goals. Alright as a real href and type. And now start with the annotation. Now you have this information here. If you, I mean it's hard, you can't see the maximum parsimony is added here, right? So it's kind of metadata already added here. And you can see the URL of the ontology. This is like a real example exactly how we annotate and add the metadata to the XML file. Okay. Is useful. If you try to install and you work with that, you can just contact me. Um, so I think it's almost five o'clock. We have some more slides um, for like two use cases of this um, one, for example, which discuss in the book. But I don't know, we can discuss about that now or next session. I think this is not very important, so if somebody has class, go away, you can go and we can continue to finish this up, otherwise it will be too much. All right, uh, so this is just one example of, uh, I'm sorry, we have to uh, one example for school web services. Uh, so um, if you actually went through that, is an example of uh, somebody wants to send a zip, a zip code and basically find all of the uh, movies in that area, right? And uh, with the map and the, all the information. So the service one actually just send a, um, a zip code here. As you can see, we have two some web services here, the movie finder, and this is service one. The movie finder, and another one is the uh, the actually uh, map uh, finder, which find all of the location of that movie. It's kind of two service which supposed to pass in parameter to each other. That's what I try to explain here. So uh, service one actually pass the zip code here, and here the key component in this architecture is proxy server because in proxy server we have all of the ontology. We have all of the S mashup editor and uh, all of the uh, actually annotation differing and lowering and model referencing. All this explained in chapter five. I didn't have a chance to go through this actually this kind of annotation. It's happened here. It's all repository here for find the ontology and then uh, find the annotated data because you can see all of the services is connected to that. And then uh, the actually uh, the. Uh, service provider, provider send a zip code to this proxy and proxy can uh, actually send a request, uh, get the data and annotate it with the ontology or whatever it has, like uh, all of these uh, steps for annotation, and then uh, get the annotated data and send it to the service provider too. 
to get the rest of the information, like the map and location uh, of the um, movie. And as you can see in the right hand, uh, just show the result. Here the whole actually idea about this actual picture in the book, I think uh, he wanted to exactly explain what's the rule of uh, process server here, which can, all of this annotation will happen here, and how the uh, input that uh, output from one service could be input for another service to get the final result. That's just one example from the book.